Okay. So our next speaker is Dr. Laura Ross, who is an assistant professor, well, the British counterpart of that, at the University of Edinburgh. And today she will be talking about some of her work on unusual evolutionary systems in insects. I'm going to let you load your talk. inviting me and flying me all the way over from Edinburgh. Pretty amazing. Um, I feel I really need to make my 15 minutes worth getting here. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> I'll try. So I just want to start firstly by introducing myself a little bit and talk a little bit about sort of Europe scientific careers versus US scientific careers, given that it's a bit different. So I was a Darwin Fellow here for eight months uh, in 2010 and 2011. The reason that I stayed for such a short time was that, quite to my surprise, uh, I got a Royal Society Fellowship for to, um, to go to Oxford. Uh, I, to my surprise, because I applied nine months earlier and I hadn't heard a word, and then suddenly got an email uh, about a week before I was going to fly here. That was a little stressful, but fun. So I, I went back, spent two years in Oxford, and then applied for a um, sort of more senior fellowship from the Natural Environmental Research Council, um, which I ended up getting. And it's basically five years of your salary, but also five years of like basically an NHF-sized grant of research money, and you're um, allowed to take it anywhere you like in the UK. So I decided to go back to Edinburgh, where I spent most of my time doing my PhD, because it's a great place to be and it's a great place to work. So that's where I'm based now, and I've started up my lab, and I have PhD students studying next year, and stuff like that, so I'm getting settled. But now I want to talk to you a bit about science. So in order to sort of let you know what, what I study, I want to start with this picture because I think this is what most people sort of think about when we think about reproduction. We think about each offspring having a mom and a dad, um, each mom and dad contributing an equal portion of genes to their offspring, and the sex of each offspring being determined by some sort of sex chromosome. And that's indeed a very common way in which animals reproduce. However, about 20% of all animals do it other ways. Um, and a really an important focus of my research is trying to understand why is there such a variation in a, in a process that is so fundamental to life that we can't really do without reproduction, can we? Um, and also, especially trying to understand the phylogenetic distribution of some of these different reproductive systems across the tree of life, and especially across the tree of animals. So in order to study this question, I have really focused over the last couple of years from the start of my PhD throughout my two postdocs and my current fellowship um, while trying to understand this question using this group of insects, the scale insects. And this is the group that um, also Ben Normark works on. This is how I got in touch with Ben in the first place, like about six months after I started my PhD. Um, I emailed Ben and invited him over to come and give a talk, and we've been in touch ever since. So basically the reason I studied scale insects, like the reason I decided to study scale insects, is that they have probably the most variable reproduction of any group of a similar size. They have about as much variation as insects as a whole in a group of about 8,000 species, so they're really great for trying to understand what causes these variation. So I've done a bunch of different approaches um, using both theoretical, comparative, population genetic and experimental approaches in order to study the evolution and the distribution of some of these reproductive systems, which, for example, include hermaphroditism, where individuals are both sexes at the same time, and true haplodiploidy, for example. But what I really want to do today is focus on some more recent and unpublished work of the evolution of this one really particular reproductive system called maternal genome elimination. The reason I chose to talk about this today is that this is the main focus of my five-year fellowship, um, which I've only started in se September or July. So I don't have that much data yet, but I did think um, there would, would be worth talking a little bit about it and letting you know sort of where I'm going and with my lab in the next couple of years. So let's talk about paternal genome elimination. I don't think it's something most people are familiar with, but it's a reproductive system, not just found in scale insects, but actually found 
um, has evolved about seven times across insects and mites, and it's found in thousands of thousands of species, including some scale insects, but there's also some beetles, some flies, the human body lice, springtails, mites, a whole range of things. But what is it? So paternal genome elimination is a way of reproducing where reproduction is strictly sexual, so all offspring are produced by mating between a male here and a female there, but then in suns something really strange happens. So although suns start out as diploid individuals with genes from both their parents, all the chromosomes that they get from their father become silenced early in development in all somatic cells, and then they're eliminated from the germline. So these males will only ever pass their mother's genes on to the next generation, and they never pass on any of their father's genes. While females are just totally normal, they're diploid, and their eggs contain both genes from their father and from their mother. So it's this really kind of weird asymmetric system. So the question is, how could such a bizarre asymmetric system evolve? So in general, people have thought that the idea behind it is something like this. Basically, a mother, that can, a mother normally if she produces a son, this son will pass on her genes half to half her offspring, or half the time. And the other half the time, he'll pass on his father's genes. However, if she can make a male that eliminates her partner's gene, his, her partner's genes, this male will only ever pass on her genes to the next generation. So she'll basically have more genes in her grandchildren, and therefore this could spread. But this is an incredibly general benefit. This would basic, this would would apply to every single sexual reproduction species on Earth. Um, so if this is that beneficial, why then? Don't we have paternal genome elimination, basically? So why don't other species have paternal genome elimination? And in order to understand this, I had a look at sort of features that um, that we see in multiple species in a different origin to paternal genome elimination. So what we had looked at. So these are all the seven origins that we know of, and basically what we see in each of these groups is that the genome that is eliminated is always the paternal one. So it's always the father's genes that are eliminated, never the mother's genes. It's always only in males. It's all, uh, genes are always eliminated from males, not from females, which is also an unusual observation. Then another thing that really seems to sort of be present in almost all cases of paternal genome elimination is that there's a lot of mating between close relatives, so a lot of brother-sister matings. They have mating systems where brother-sister mating is very common. And, all, and lastly, although in paternal genome elimination, <coughs> sex tends to not be determined by sex chromosomes, their ancestral system would evolve from always seem to be XXXY or XXXO. So we don't really find ZZZW like in birds or butterflies. We don't really ever seem, seem, seem that, uh, <coughs> see that that gives rise to paternal genome elimination or to any sort of genome elimination. So we wanted to understand why. Basically, when you when you start off, when you have a normal um, diploid system with X chromosomes and Y chromosomes, and paternal genome elimination would evolve, something really strange happens because this son that eliminates his father's genes will all, therefore always eliminate his Y chromosome because he always inherits his Y chromosome from his father, and therefore all his sperm will only ever contain X chromosomes, and as a result, he only can ever have <coughs> daughters; he can never have a son. So it means that once paternal genome elimination starts spreading in a population like this, the sex ratio becomes really, really female biased. This could potentially limit the spread of a system like that. However, from sex ratio theory, we know that submating actually selects for female biased sex ratios. And remember from the previous slide, we saw that paternal genome elimination is often associated with submating. So that maybe, maybe this is what drives the evolution of paternal genome elimination in systems with an XY system that have submitted. So in order to test this idea, I worked together with my collaborator at St. Andrews, uh, Andy Gardner, and made this big, quite complex mathematical model to sort of try to see how, how genome elimination could evolve under all possible scenarios, so in males or in females or the maternal or the paternal genes are being eliminated. So we basically just went through all possibilities you could imagine, even if, they, if we don't actually find them in nature to see what would happen. And this is the result. It's a bit of a complex slide. But basically what we looked at, we saw 
what would happen if an allele that caused genome elimination would evolve either in a system with XXXY sex determination, like for example in us, or in ZZZW, like in butterflies or birds, so where females have a Z or ZW. And then we looked at different levels of sit mating, so from zero to one, and then we looked at the potential for uh, genome elimination on the y-axis here. And basically, when, when these lines are on the zero line, that means that for an autosom autosomal gene, there's no benefit of, of genome elimination. It's a completely neutral trait. If this line, for example, here is below zero, then it's strongly discouraged, or it's strongly selected against. However, if it's above zero here, and there's only two cases where you can see where it is above zero, then it's actually favored. So this, these are cases where genome elimination would actually be selected for, uh, given a certain probability of sub mating. And the higher the sub mating, for example here, the higher the percentage of potential genome elimination here. And what we see is basically only two cases of all the possible scenarios we looked at. Both of them are elimination of the paternal genome, so PGE, not maternal genome elimination. One case in females under ZW, and one case in males under XY. So these are sort of the only scenarios we can imagine it would really would, could evolve. And so the one case where it evolves in males under XY, XX, um, XX is exactly what we see in nature. This is the case we that has evolved about seven times in nature. And what we see is that if you look at where PGE will end up, so not the invasion analysis, but where what, what equilibrium state it will reach, here it will go up with submating, but in general it will sort of somehow end up in an inter intermediate frequency. So some males will eliminate their gene, the, their paternal genome, others don't. And that's and it's basically the sex ratio, selection for sex ratios that keeps it intermediate. However, in the other case, in the case of paternal genome elimination in females with ZW, what happens is that the frequency of PGE is driven to one, to fully, to complete. And that's a problem, because these males, these, these, these females can only have daughters, and will therefore really quickly drive the population extinct, because they're no longer any males in order to fertilize these females. So basically, our idea is that the reason we only really see this case in nature and not this case is that this might evolve very frequently, but will just drive populations extinct within a few generations or a few hundred generations. Well, this would actually stick around. So I think it gives quite a nice idea of why we see only this one type of genome elimination in nature and not sort of all these different types. So basically, what I've looked at until now is it's sort of the interest of the average autosomal gene in a male. Uh, and the average autosomal gene in males under, under some level of segmenting is in favor of eliminating half its genome. However, this is a bit different when you kind of consider the maternal copy and the paternal copy of each allele some separately. Because basically, a paternal copy is not that happy about being eliminated, unless segmenting is really, really high. While the maternal copy quite likes being, in, quite likes it when her uh, her partner basically is eliminated because then she gets transmitted at a much higher rate. So there's quite a large area here where we would expect so genetic conflict between maternal and paternal copies of a, a gene within within an individual within a male. And we expect that there's to be some sort of co-evolutionary battle between maternal and paternal genes in an individual, and that would suggests that maybe paternal denomination is actually quite a labile trait where the maternal copy is trying to keep it high up, keep paternal denomination high, while the paternal copy is trying to suppress it, trying to avoid being eliminated, basically. And you could imagine that that continual process over time will cause the evolution and then the reversion, evolution and reversion of paternal denomination. This is something I wanted to test. And the thing is, of all those clades that we have, which we know of paternal genome elimination. People have assumed that it's everywhere, it's in the whole clade, but often we only really have data for maybe five species, if we're lucky, only one sometimes. And really the only clade where we have a bit more information, we can test these IDs, are the scale insects. 
Um, we have data for about 500 species out of the 8,000, so it's, it's not bad. It really is pretty good. Um, and the reason we have so much data is that there have been some great cytologists in the 1960s, so 1950s to 1980s, that are just sat behind their microscope all day long, every day, just looking through species and species after species. But what these papers from the 1960s were talking about, Spencer Brown showed, is that although paternodilomination is super widespread, it evolved once, it's really widespread, there are two possible re reversions. Um, but they're based on like one specimen sometime in the 1960s. Um, so I wanted to go and look into this a bit further. And in order to do this, I collaborate with Lynn Cook, who is in the University of Queensland in Brisbane. The reason I collaborate with Lynn is that she studies the group of insects where one of these reversions took place, this little golf-forming scale insect that nobody is. Um, so what we wanted to do is basically start with this species and then look at basically all species that were related to it and sort of work outwards and try to survey as many species as we could get our hands on. And getting our hands on species required doing a lot of uh, field work in eucalyptus forests around Queensland. This is what I've basically been doing this winter. That is a great way of like escaping Scotland in winter and going to Australia in summer. And these, they form these really cool like big goals. Some of them form these really huge goals. And then what we did was looking, using cytological techniques. And the great thing of scale insects is that you can really easily score paternal genome elimination. Because in males, the, the silenced paternal genomes, the silenced paternal chromosomes bump together in this really bright dot. So you can actually just look, stain an embryo, and see if these dots are present or not, and then you know if paternal genome elimination is present or not. It's really great. You can't just do it for embryos. You can just take whole bugs, squash them under the microscope with a bit of um, with a bit of stain, and you can again see all the little bright dots here. It's a bit hard to see, but trust me. That's a male, this is a female, uh, and they have paternal genome elimination. So basically what this allowed us to do is to literally go through about 30 or 40 species, and most of them these Australian gulf forming species, and look if it's present or not, and combine this with phylogenetic, uh, phylogenetic data we had as well. And basically what we see is that the blue, the blue lines, all the blue names here, are ones where we confirmed that paternal genome elimination was actually present. But we found, this was the original one where we thought, where we knew it was lost. But actually we found a whole lot more where paternal germination seems to be lost. And then we found all these weird intermediates, the purple ones here, where we only really saw um, the condensation, only really saw those dots in certain stages or certain tissues. So it really seems like, unless what people have sort of thought before, that paternal genome elimination is a really sort of conserved trait across really large plates, it's actually really, like, really laid out and it's evolving back and forth and back and forth. So this is a really preliminary analysis. Uh, this is basically just a month work in Australia. But we're now uh, applying for more money to try to get a big grant in order to work further on this, on this. And especially focusing on this one genus where Two species have and just once two species don't have paternal genome elimination, one species have. We're developing molecular markers in order to sort of track the transmission genetics of these species. So I hope I've given you a bit of a, a glimpse of why paternal genome elimination is cool, why I think it's a great thing to work on. Um, and re really me and my lab will be focusing on trying to understand it in a lot more detail. The reason we're so interested in trying to understand it is that it's, a, it's not just a cool system, it also gives you some really general insights in the effect of genetic conflict, for example, on shaping animal reproduction. And also gives us insight in the evolution of haplodiploidy, which is much more common in related reproductive system. So the things we're doing at the moment is, for example, using RNA-seq techniques to look at gene expression of paternal and maternal copies in males in this mealybug here, which is a species that I have in the lab. And then another thing we're doing is, I've actually started working on the human body lines with John Clark here, so you probably see a lot more of me in the next couple of years because I'm collaborating very extensively. Because th this guy here, they have paternal genome elimination, but not in every male. So you can actually do crosses and track the transmission, track the inheritance of, of paternal genome elimination across generations, which is really, really cool. 
So I hope that gives you a bit of an idea where I'm coming from, what I'm doing. I would like to thank my main collaborators, of course, Ben, who hosted me here as a Darwin Fellow, and a number of my other collaborators, and lots of other people and funding bodies. Thank you very much.